Hey, so now that we are finished with our explorations with doing uh, value scale drawings and using different types of kind of black, white, gray materials, now it's time to venture into the realm of color. So let's start with a little bit of a chat about color and some color inspirations and influences over time. So with this lecture, we're going to talk about creating a fully developed drawing as well as some color strategies in relation to drawing. So first off with creating a fully developed drawing, you want to start by, you know, what you deciding on what you want to draw and gather your materials. Do note that working artists generally start with a conceptual idea that they have in mind to depict. You know, address the conceptual aspects and subject matter of your piece. You know, lists of, make kind of lists of ideas and subjects that you might want to pursue and write everything down. You know, gather possible objects and or images that you might integrate into your work. Um, but as a beginner with this process of developing our work, uh, we will start with something a, a little bit more straightforward, a still life. So gather your own objects to work with, but think carefully about what meaning these objects might express and how multiple objects relate to one another to form suggested meaning. So the next step in this process would be to frame your composition to create preliminary sketches, which we will call thumbnail sketches. So for this step, we will be working on creating these thumbnail sketches. So for working artists, this process might also include, you know, more developed preliminary sketches. You know, thumbnail sketches should be somewhat small in scale and should quickly capture the major compositional elements of the image. So this means determining the placement of the subject within the proportional shape of the paper, cropping parts of the image, etc. You know, try you're you're trying to really distill your compositions to the most fundamental aspects so that you can see the image as a whole and evaluate how the balance is working in the composition. So small thumbnail sketches should be really simple <clears throat> to be drawn in, you know, less than 10 minutes per sketch, you know, maybe even three to five minutes. So keeping the time you spend on each, you know, sketch relatively short means that you're more likely to punch out as many ideas as possible, as opposed to getting fixated on one sketch prematurely. So I hear people saying all the time that they don't need to make more sketches because their first sketch was their favorite. So be the exception and produce as many sketches as possible. You'll be pleasantly surprised at what happens when you take the time and the initiative to explore your subject in depth. So be willing to consider any option when creating these sketches. This is the stage where it's easy to experiment since the sketches are so quick, small, and so therefore, you're not so heavily invested in them. Take this chance to make lots of mistakes and get bad ideas out of your system. So I oftentimes, you know, pur purposefully draw the most cliche, obvious response just so I can eliminate it and move on to the most more, more innovative approaches. So think about this process as, you know, creating a smorgasbord of options, creating a tremendous variety that you can then select from. So no one wants a buffet where there's only one dish, right? Um, so basically the sketches, the more sketches you have, the better. So this is a little bit more of an overview of how the drawing will proceed, you know, work on the gesture drawing, then go to an organizational line and citing your proportion and scale, then develop value or color, and then go to more detailing, refining the drawing. So in theory, you've done a good job in um, your preliminary sketches, you know, so the final piece should be mostly smooth sailing. So the process from this point forward proceeds from the processes that I've been demonstrating to you progressively throughout this series of lessons. We always begin with a drawing with a gesture. Uh, we then make our, you know, correct proportions and scale with citing and organizational lines. We then develop value and color and finish by adding final details throughout. It is a process of layering and developing the work as a unified whole that considers both the subject matter as well as the background area throughout the entire process and development of the work. So up to this point, we've been working on developing our skills with value, with just black and white and gray. Um, you got to start with this process of developing a fully rendered drawing in value. And with this demonstration that I will take you through, you know, we will try the process of developing a fully rendered uh, work in color from this point forward. Um, so since we have not addressed color in depth up to this point, I'm going to discuss some of these details in more in depth uh, regarding composing in color and also some of the influences on contemporary attitudes toward color in art.
a little bit of review to start with, we have the classic color wheel. Um, so this color wheel diagram follows, you know, shows the following elements. You have analogous colors. So the basic color wheel, you know, arranges these six segments of solar radiation in order of their wavelengths. You have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, with the long and short wave ends of the spectrum, red and violet, connected up from to form a kind of circular continuum. The spectrum can certainly be divided more elaborately, as in the 10 hue Munsell wheel used in industry. The six color wheel is generally preferred by artists, however, as a simple, you know, more easily uh, rendered diagram of basic relationships. So analogous colors are those that are close to each other on the color wheel. They are generally harmonious, as in the yellows, oranges, and reds of autumn foliage. And they are often used to describe shifts from warms to cools created by sunlight and shadow. So the color wheel diagrams the primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. The primary colors, which are red, yellow, and blue, are those that can be combined in various mixtures to create all of the colors. Or to reverse the definition, there are unique hues that cannot be produced from anything else. That's what the red, yellow, and blue are. So secondary colors are derived from a mixture of the primaries. So orange would be from red and yellow, green from yellow and blue, and violet from blue and red. Tertiary colors are shown on the basic color wheel, but they are implied. They're not necessarily shown um, by the fact that the spectrum can be divided by, you know, a huge amount of um, narrower and narrower bands of radiation. So the color of the six colors of the color wheel may be extended to 12 by in-between mixtures, you know, yellow-green, yellow, blue-green, yellow, blue blue-violet, red-violet, red-orange, and yellow-orange. There's also complementary colors on the color wheel. So complementary colors are those that, you know, when combined, incorporate all the rays of the spectrum. So the dictionary defini defines um, complement as either of two things needed to complete each other. And on the color wheel, complementary hues are shown as opposites. Red versus green, blue versus orange, and yellow versus violet. So when they're used together, they create brilliant, vibrating, or even clashing effects, which are really interesting optically when you're creating a drawing or a painting. So they are also opposites psychologically. And in their references to nature, you know, fire and ice, which be or orange and blue, sun and shadow, yellow and violet, and flower and foliage, red and green, and so on. So unlike analogous hues, these are colors of extreme contrast. So value refers to a color's lightness or darkness. You know, we were talking about that a little bit um, with translating those color objects maybe into grayscale. So pale colors with everyday names like pink, aqua, and aqua are def identified technically as reds and blues of high value while um, dark colors like maroon and navy are defined as reds and blues of low value or darker value. So in this you know, value intensity chart, the vertical columns show four different hues, which would be red, green, yellow, and violet in value and scales shading from light to dark. They have been made by lightening each basic hue with white to form tints and adding black to create darker shades. So intensity, on the other hand, measures a color's brightness or saturation. To put it another way, intensity refers to a color's purity and freedom from the dilution of other colors. Um, thus, the crosswise bands in this chart show how colors become dulled by complementary mixtures. So, you know, mixing, you know, purple and yellow together, you know, dulls that color, for instance. And here, you know, you have also red that moves towards a brownish gray when mixed with green. And as I mentioned, yellow is similarly neutralized by violet. The contrast of H and N shapes also helps to explain the difference between value and intensity. Uh, as you see, each hue has a particular value when it is at full intensity. Thus, the green to red crossband is horizontal because both hues are in the same mid-value range, whereas the yellow to violet band is diagonal because these colors are value opposites, yellow being intrinsically light in hue and violet a fairly dark one. There is probably no more difficult color principle to grasp than the distinction between value and intensity. Because words like dark and light describing value and dull and bright describing intensity sound so much alike. Nor is the different 
it's always, you know, really evident in looking at the actual colors. In this value intensity chart, the left sunny side shows dark, medium, and light values of a bright or high intensity color, while the shadow side shows dark, medium, and light values of a dull or low intensity version of the same basic hue. So this diagram shows you how value and intensity function as different variables. It also demonstrates that of the two, value is the more measurable quality and hence of somewhat greater importance for the artist. Whereas the eye makes a different, it uh, makes an immediate assessment of these dark, medium, and light stripes, the precise hue and intensity of the colors is harder to assess. Accordingly, accordingly painters, you know, generally pay fairly systematic attention to dark and light patterns, while other aspects of the color are approached more intuitively. So complementary hues representing opposing, opposing halves of the spectrum are the most dynamic of partners. There are three basic complementary relationships, red-green, blue-orange, and yellow-violet. They may be varied by pairing a vivid version of one color with a muted tone of the other, or by using off-hues like greenish-blue and orange-red instead of exact complements. It is important to remember that complementary colors have tremendous psychological importance. They touch upon deep-seated universal experiences. In even the most abstract art, green reminds us of nature's greenery, red of its flowers, and blue will forever stand for the sea and the sky, orange for fire, purple for royalty, and yellow for the sun. So red and green, this red and green cord is especially useful, you know, since the green of trees and plants is the subject of so much representational work, and red is its natural foil. So, you know, how do you feel about this piece that you see here? Is it calming? These are the warmest of the compliments, and hence the most cheerful. You see both orange and blue and yellow and violet are warm versus uh, cool opposites. And red and green, on the other hand, are evenly matched partners. Both are warm, both are of a middle, you know, kind of value, and qualities that set up a really vibrating optical glitter when they touch. So figure ground relationships are interesting here in this, uh, since orange and blue don't tend them, lend themselves e as easily as red and green to reversed roles. Blue is stubbornly recessive. So how does this piece compare? More dynamic, less calming? Still, another characteristic of blue is its power, beyond that of any color to suggest infinity. Orange, by contrast, is a hot color, full of movement. The yellow-violet harmony can be summed up in a single word, exotic, for while red-green reminds us of trees and flowers, orange-blue of the earth and the sky, yellow-violet uh, you know, has little connection with everyday experience. Think about where you might recall this color combination. You know, instead, you might, it might be difficult to figure that out. You might find it maybe in a rare butterfly, in a tropical bird, unearthly sunsets, costumes of the Far East, and the trappings of royalty. So there are at least two situations in which this exotic combination is especially effective. The first is the time-honored icon format, the, the presentation of a ceremonial image on a stylized background. So medieval saints were shown on panels of celestial gold leaf, and this solemn approach has been revived over and over again in modern art. So look at Diego Rivera's Mexican peasants, Ruos, you know, biblical kings, Walt Kuhn's clowns, and Chuck Close's photorealist portraits. So a second quite different role for yellow and violet is to be found in the 19th century impressionist tradition of radiant light. For Monet and Pizarro, uh, lemon and lavender often represented sunlight and shadow in an overall vision of open air luminosity. The main thing to note here is that given the right emphasis, a single touch of color is sufficient to set up a complementary polarity. In this case, one spot of bright yellow in a doorway is balanced by a vast expanse of pale violet on the side of a barn. <clears throat> So analogous colors are neighboring hues, and they're pleasantly harmonious colors rather than dynamic opposites. So instead of analogous harmonies, we can also speak of, you know, closely related colors or simply of working with reds or greens or blues. Hence, we refer to Picasso's blue period. You know, it isn't with any thought of like a truly monochromatic scheme, but of a generally bluish harmony. 
Such a blue chord uh, would typically range from green to violet with a true blue at the center of its sequence. It may seem strange to identify a sensation of temperature with visual realm of color. Um, however, experiments have demonstrated a difference in five to seven degrees in subjective feeling of heat or cold between a workroom painted in blue-green and one painted in red-orange. That is, in the blue-green room, the occupants felt that uh, 59 degrees Fahrenheit was cold, whereas in the red-orange room, they did not feel cold until the temperature fell to 52 or 54 degrees. Objectively, this meant that blue-green slows down the circulation and red-orange stimulates it. So warm and cool color relationships can be used to produce highly pictorial effects. In landscape, more distant objects always seem cooler in color because of the intervening depth of air. Cool colors therefore recede while warm colors advance. Cool, cold warm contrast then contains elements suggesting nearness and distance. So because our current attitudes toward color have been shaped by earlier artists, a quick survey of some innovations in their treatment of color during the past hundred years is in order. So we might begin with what might be called the revolution of the color patch, the revolutionary way the Impressionists implied color. With Impressionism in the late 19th century, artists began to depend on a more purely visual sensation. Their concern was the way light in its multiple aspects changes forms, and their approach was scientific in many respects. So recording the stimulation of the optic nerve by light, they began working outdoors directly from nature, using a new palette of brighter pigments and purer colors, applying them in broken patches. Dark shadows were eliminated, local color was ignored, and the local values of tones were abstracted to create atmospheric effects. The Impressionists were innovators in color application, applying it in perceptible strokes, unlike the smooth brush surfaces that characterized earlier works. The outlines of objects were blurred to make them merge into their backgrounds. The volumes were diminished in favor of describing the effect of light over a form. So these quick broken strokes suggesting you know, the flicker of light resulted in a sameness or uniformity in the overall texture that flattened the image and created a compressed space. So such strokes had the added bonus of allowing the artist to work more directly in space with the changing light. The Impressionists saw that color is relative. When light changes, color changes. They created multiple images of the same subject under different lighting conditions, as you can see here with Claude Monet's haystacks. The Impost Impressionists continued their predecessors' investigations into color. They used complementary colors in large areas to intensify each other and in small daubs to neutralize each other. They, you know, interpreted shadow as modified color, not simply as black or gray, and they made use of optically blended color. The viewer blends colors visually. For example, a dab of red adjacent to a dab of green will be blended by the eye to appear gray. So these complementary hues in a small contrasting areas also made for greater luminosity and greatly enlivened the surface, surfaces of the paintings. So early in the 20th century, a group of painters called the Fauves, which means wild beasts, um, who were familiar with the color advances of the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists, renounced the pretense of recreating reality and began a subjective and symbolic investigation of color. They sought a heightened reality more exaggerated than actual appearances. The Fauves used pure, unbroken color uh, to further limit traditional perspective, depth, and volume. Fauvism, uh, Matisse said, meant construction by color, which was the source of everything that followed in Matisse's long and illustrious career. So color, freed from tonal modeling, was used to convey the artist's response to the subject matter. Color was immediate, fundamental. It was the means of orchestrating the surface with complex harmonies and dissonances. The red studio here is made up of spatially dislocated images and suspended objects in a color field of red. The color was the primary element in Matisse's art. The interaction of adjacent colors determined form. So Matisse was greatly influenced by Persian miniatures, 
by their profusely patterned surfaces um, used to organize the picture plane and by their non-Western perspective. Although he rejected Western perspective, he did not uh, follow the spatial innovations of his contemporaries, the Cubists, with their multiple perspectives and fragmented images. The different periods of Matisse's long career were all involved with what he spoke of as the internal conflict of drawing and color, the reciprocation between the two fundamental pictorial elements. In the early 1940s, he saw the way to integrate these two elements. Instead of drawing on an outline and filling in color, I am drawing directly on color, he said. He began drawing with scissors by cutting shapes from paper he had pre-painted. Eventually, owing to his crippling arthritis, cutouts formed virtually his own only means of expression. His last style from 1950 to 54 culminated with an outpouring of brilliant large-scale cutouts that served as designs for the Vence Chapel, for stained glass windows, and for large ceramic tile murals. Matisse spoke of the Vence Chapel as the culmination and summation of his life's work. Wazili Kandinsky, you know, a contemporary of the Fauves, uh, carried freeing color a giant step forward into abstraction. In placing emphasis on co composition and color, he left representation of objects behind. His goal was to infuse shapes that had no reference to recognizable objects with a symbolic and metaphysical intensity, and he saw that the most direct means of achieving that goal was through the use of color. His memoirs open with a sentence, in the beginning was color. The abstract expressionist continued Kandinsky's freedom of paint application, but it was Hans Hoffmann who was the teacher and theoretician for the advancement of modernist ideas concerning color and space. Fundamental perceptions led Hoffmann to his rules concerning the flatness of the picture plane and the necessity for preserving its two-dimensionality. So foremost among his teachings were those dealing with color tensions to create spatial dynamics, his famous push and pull concept. Hoffman's you know, art rules of pictorial grammar dealt with the distinction between positive and negative space, the autonomy of the picture plane, and the visual interaction of warm and cool colors to create pictorial spatial illusion. Hoffman's theories concerning the colors, uh, perception, perceptual retreating and advancing in pictorial space laid the groundwork for many of the color experiments in art in later in the century. They had special influence on the color field artists and on modernist attitudes toward color in general. So expressionists throughout this century, the German expressionists before World War I, and the abstract expressionists in the 1940s and 1950s and the neo-expressionists in the 1980s all have used color to underline their own emotional responses. Strong contrasting colors applied in thick slashes and strokes um, give urgency to a charged content. Color field artists in the 1960s saw that they could communicate essentially through color alone, reducing their formal means and limiting late shape line, value, and texture, they depended on color to carry the weight of the work, both in form and in content. The color field painters can be said to be dealing with the physiological effects of color. The scale of these artists' works is so large that the viewer's peripheral vision is encompassed. Envisioning the difference between a spot of red on a wall and an entire wall of red will enable you to understand better the concept of enveloping color. The view is, viewer is absorbed by the expanse of color in a color field painting. Experience and vision are one. So the strategy of the pop artists in the 1960s and 70s was to use technology and common objects in a man-made environment as sources of technique and imagery. They used advertising techniques and established a new palette based on color television and advertising and layouts. Um, you know, colors were intensified and often garish. Then the photorealists used film colors to establish their color. They were taking their color schemes directly from the photograph, and they present the viewer with an alternate means to establish reality or verification. Image, color, and technique are derived from photography. So in contemporary art, color maintains its decisive role. All the earlier uses of color are exploited, the representative, emotive, psychological, and, and symbolic impact, and for their um, subjective and objective functions. So this artist, Leila Ali, creates unique works on paper using gouache, which are inspired by images from the news. 
Technology has provided new impetus for dealing with color, as seen in this work by Tom Burkhart. Burkhart makes, makes um, you know, digital scans of images. He then prints them onto pages of old books, adding his own drawn images in colored ink. So two dissimilar categories of images appear, appeal to the artist, industrial equipment and Eastern decorative objects. Burkhart deals in contradictions between found images and drawn editions, between hand-drawn forms and digitized scans, between East and West, between the industrial and the decorative. Color enriches and ties together hit the disparate techniques, images, and ideas. So the overriding lesson um, contemporary artists have learned in, is that color is relative. Through a lifetime experiment of experimentation, Joseph Albers investigated the relativity of color. In his theoretical writing and his work, he offered ample proof that color is not absolute, but interacts with and is affected by its surroundings. Since colors are always seen in context in a relationship with other colors, artists must make use of this knowledge of color relationships. And so with the fully developed drawings that you will produce, consider your concept, uh, subject, including the background, as well as the composition, value, and color. All of these elements contribute significantly towards the total expression of a fully developed work of art. Great, so now that we have a little bit of insight into color and how to deal with color, let's try it out ourselves with some drawing.